Good evening, everyone, and thank you for being here. On behalf of the International Center for Ethnic Studies in Colombo, I'd like to welcome you to the fourth session of our five-part series titled Countering Hate Speech, which is the first of two practical sessions on the topic. Thank you to the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation South Asia for their support for this series. If you require translation of this session to Sinhala or Tamil, please click the globe icon on the bottom panel of the Zoom screen and select the language you require. I would like to introduce to you our speakers for this evening who are both from Hashtag Generation, a movement led and run by a group of young tech savvy, socially conscious Sri Lankans advocating for the meaningful civic and political participation of youth, especially young women and young people from minority groups. Nekmini Madhavala is the director of programs and Sanil Rachi is the director and co-founder. We will have a question and answer session, but feel free to send in any questions during the session or any comments, and we will uh, keep this session as engaging as possible. And also, if you're watching on Facebook Live, we appreciate your engagement as well. Over to you, Senel and Nethmini. Um, hi, good, even, good, uh, good evening, brother. Um, so I would like to thank the International Center for Ethnic Studies for organizing this really time discussion and also for having us and all the participants, uh, like it was said, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to ask or if you prefer to type it in, that is also fine by us. So whenever uh, whenever you have a question, so we'll take up the questions. Um, so Nabila, like Nabila said, hashtag generation, we have been working on this area um, and on social media since 2015. Uh, in she has a voluntary group and now as a full-time staff run operation. Um, so uh, what we are going to share is based on our findings, what we have realized over the time, and also uh, based from the international best practice, uh, breaks practices. Um, yeah, so to start, um, we can go to the next slide where we thought we would want to run you through the inter internet landscape of Sri Lanka uh, because we thought it's uh, really important that uh, everyone understands how the internet usage of Sri Lanka is right now into in the sense January by January 2021, especially because what we're trying to discuss today is to uh, how we can promote um, to use social media or internet spaces critically um, and also how to navigate these digital spaces, especially when we have uh, waves and waves of hate speech and disinformation, right? So if you look at this screen, you see um, we have 10.9 million of internet users in Sri Lanka. That is half our population. And um, since 2020 January to 2021 January, we see 800,000, the number of people who use this internet has grown uh, by 800,000. This is mainly because it was COVID and everyone started working from home and studying from home. And also really important statistics is that out of this 10.9 million people who use internet in Sri Lanka, we also see 98.7% uses their mobile phones to access internet which means 98.7% of the 10.9 million, which is almost 11 million, has access to internet almost immediately um, in their palm, right? So that is the level of access that we are talking about. And if we go to the next slide, we also wanted to highlight the top websites by traffic, according to Alexa, where we see most people, uh, the Google, Google is the most uh, used or uh, accessed website in Sri Lanka uh, by January 2021. And we also see YouTube, Facebook, and Zoom has come to number five. Um, and in middle of all of that, we also see uh, the gossip sites, the news sites, and also a couple of pornography sites on the top 20 sites that people have searched, right? So we thought it's important that we set a bit of a context and uh, to see this is the internet landscape in a very, very short glimpse, how it looks like. And I think Senator can take over. 
thank you. Thank you, Nathmini, for, for that very um, helpful introduction and also to the ICS for having us. Um, so uh, what Nathmini and I had in mind for this session, especially because we also don't have uh, a lot of time as well, was to share with uh, all of you uh, some tips, uh, basically 10 tips uh, that we uh, that both of us will run through uh, each of you. Um, and these are very basic uh, things that all of you can try and do on your day-to-day -day lives. Uh, because depending on our kind of professional commitments, personal lives and so on, we can't all be investigative journalists. We can't spend a lot of time investigating into different issues. So what's most important is that everything we see uh, on the internet, outside of the internet, that we try and consume that more critically. Uh, and that uh, we want uh, to... I can hear her. I don't know if the rest of you can hear her as well. Okay, I think it stopped. So, so I will continue. Um, so we are, what we are going to do basically is to share these tips, the 10 of them, uh, with you. And these are things that we hope you can practice in your day-to-day uh, -day lives. So this is the first one. Uh, the first one is basically very simple, and I'm guessing a lot of you might be practicing this kind of thing, but to watch out for clickbait headlines. Um, the idea of a clickbait headline is that basically they're trying to bait us, right? They're trying to get our attention. They're looking for our clicks. And this is mostly for uh, economic reasons as well, because more clicks you have, uh, then kind of the website then can pitch, in, pitch to people saying, uh, my website has this many million entries and so on, and then uh, getting more advertisements. There are also kind of features, but they're also kind of automated ways of getting these advertisements and so on. So they're looking for your clicks. Um, so um, but what a lot of us also do is to kind of not even click, just share as we see the headline. Uh, now, both of these things we think are dangerous. And on the side, we have uh, some of the things that, that they put to get our attention. Uh, some of these are things like, you know, you won't believe what happened, uh, the secret truth behind uh, this thing, uh, 10 things you need to know about, and number seven is going to blow your mind. So things that actually like arouse your curiosity and make you want to click on that link or make you just immediately want to share it. Um, we should try and resist uh, this, um, these urges. These are just examples from the COVID days of the types of things that you have shared. And by now, all of us know that all of these things are false. Uh, but at the time it was getting shared, um, at the time it was getting shared, a lot of these things, if you look at, look, look at the number of reactions, number of shares these things have, uh, they, they have lots, uh, lots of it. And this is because, uh, as we said, they are meant to provoke you, they're meant to get your attention. So they kind of have a tone of a conspiracy, a rumor, this big group trying to take over your land, your country, and so on. Um, and it's looking for your clicks in that way. So I think we should all uh, try and resist that. Now, it's easy for me to say that you guys should resist this, but how do you actually do it? Um, now, this is not easy, but one technique uh, that behavioral psychologists and so on share is this, um, is this technique called name it to tame it. Yeah. So what they say is when we see the kind of news, for example, things on the screen like right now, they are necessarily going to kind of provoke emotions in us, right? Even in those of us who we think we're the most rational people, uh, these posts actually provoke different emotions in, in us. They can be fear, they can be anxiety, they can even be joy in some situations, but they provoke some type of emotional response from us. Uh, now, the best way to kind of get your rational side of the brain to pay more attention and not the emotional side is to actually name that emotion. Uh, for instance, whether it's fear, whether it's anxiety, whether it's a joy, and so on. The moment you recognize that you're, fear, you're, you're, you're feeling fear, your brain actually starts to think more rationally. Uh, so basically the advice by, uh, by these behavior psychologists, the person who invented this technique is called Dan Siegel. Uh, he said, name the, the technique. Uh, so basically if you're looking at the screen and you see this post, then, then maybe look away from the screen and name to yourself that you're feeling fear. And that will allow you to regain kind of that rational thinking ability. And then maybe in that heat of the moment, you will not necessarily share it and like it uh, because you will uh, think a little bit more rationally. So that's a technique that I think all of us can practice and all of us should. Initially, it might seem a bit difficult, but as you do it, your brain also gets a little bit more used to it. Uh, this is the second one. This is also a bit kind of on the same vein, very uh, similar kind of thing, especially related to COVID-19. Uh, we should all take things like miracle cures and conspiracy theories with a grain of salt. Um, especially in the local context, there were so many of this type of thing that was getting shared. 
uh, on the left again we have uh, some examples that say you know scientists discover the miracle cure you won't believe the the the, the responses from this study uh, the cure that you didn't know you can make even in your own kitchen this type of thing and the, and a lot of us fell for this right and this is also not just kind of uh, humorous but also extremely dangerous because if you remember last year someone actually died uh, because they made uh, some type of concoction based on different plants and so on and they saw that uh, those ingredients and the recipe on facebook so it can actually lead to the loss of life and really dangerous uh, things as well these are just examples for types of things that that got shared everything from uh, from kottamalli to to chicken to sex uh, were given as remedies for uh, covid-19 uh, so i think all of us should kind of consume these things with a grain of salt and a bit more critically uh, the best way we can do this one of the best ways we can do this also just to run a google search um and um, and one thing that i practice all the time is also to run a google search but go to go to the news section of the google search because it shows you the most updated uh, stuff in that and that's super simple and i think that's something that all of us can do uh, pick a few keywords and run a google search okay. yeah um like senel said um the third tip i think is another useful thing especially we see this happening among in the whatsapp groups or messaging apps mostly where we say a friend has sent it or mm, the idea that okay this is breaking news share immediately so they are they are trying to create this sense of urgency because like sense said it, they try to appeal to our emotions where we get excited and we see we think okay it's a public uh, responsibility to share this information and make sure my friends are updated my family is updated etc so uh this idea of breaking news or even to say okay my friend so and so has shared it um i heard from my friend who works in this place and now let's say um i think especially during if you remember during the east sunday attacks days uh there were a lot of messages to say my friend Uh, my friend's brother who used to, who is working at this particular army camp or you know some some sort of they are trying to make make a connection and also try to say that there's real reliability in the information so that we are pushed and we are um, encouraged to send this information as soon as possible and i think when if we go to the next to um, next slide where we have couple of examples um yeah so this one uh it's one way to understand i think if that's something that whatsapp also introduced which is a cool feature in the sense it has been if this message has been forwarded so so many times it also indicates to us with the number of uh, message the arrow mark on top of the message um so in the sense so we also know because it, people used to just get a message and share it across like 20 30 groups of people at once and then especially in these uh, in the uh, instant messaging apps because we don't see what's happening in it and they are into into in encrypted as the app say so then we don't have access to this and we really find it difficult to control this uh, narratives right um and almost all the time they are either false or they are misleading and uh, i we also see this happening very much with the older generation because i think i can also relate um everyone my mother used to send me these messages a uh, long a couple of months back and i had to go through some uh, training with her to also under for her to also make her understand you just don't share messages like this but it's ha it happens right so just because a friend of uh, my friend's friend or i heard it i uh things like that or this idea of breaking news where we can't establish the link or the responsibility if you get these messages please verify before you circulate them uh so um yeah this is also an interesting thing we also wanted to highlight this 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 is this actually happened um a couple of month i think somewhere last year where there was a new story i think it was couple of couple of sites news sites uh, uh took this news with them where they said the who 
has uh, ranked Sri Lanka, Sri Lankan health as one of the world's best, right? So this is in the middle of the pandemic. And I think this is also closer to the press, uh, parliamentary election days. And then it was a celeb celebration to see, you know, this has happened um, and they have recognized our efforts. And this page, the, the picture that is shown in on top, hand, top right hand corner of your screen was also shared. Um, the most important thing is when you see these news cycle, news items, it's really, really important that we cross check the date of this news, right? Uh, because this statement was actually made. It's not that it wasn't made. It was made, but it was made in the year 2018. This was way before when it was shared, uh, I think, in 2020. Um, so that's one thing where you actually, like Senator said, you actually go and Google and see, ha uh, have we been ranked as world's best? Uh, we might have. So then when were, when did we get that ranking or the accreditation, things like that. And I think we have a couple of slides towards the latter part of the presentation where we can also show you how you can check the timestamp of, of certain information. Um, but uh, because if you can see on the top, in the black, the red color uh, square, we talk about busting fake news, right? So fake news is this um, all encompassing to a word or a term that was used by different agencies. Uh, and it, it was, it became really popular with Trump. Uh, but we also want to talk a, a bit about what really fake news entails because it has three parts misinformation, disinformation, and malinformation. We also thought it's better to have this conversation. But before we uh, discuss what's in this slide, we thought we'll also want to do a bit of a group activity um, where we get the all attendees and all panelists also can take part, where we will send you a link to a poll. And I will also type that question on the chat we want you to answer to that question on the chat by when you uh, on the space that you get by following the link, right? So I have sent the link and the question also on the chat. The question is, who do you who do you think are some of the key targets of hate speech in Sri Lanka? And I think everyone who's joining on Facebook also. Mm, I think one of the team members would post this question and the link to the poll on the uh, comment section of Facebook. Um, you can also take part. We can take like two to three minutes where you follow the link immediately and then answer the question. The question is, who do you think are some of the key targets of hate speech in Sri Lanka? Peter, could you please type these words uh, when you follow the poll, you will get a space where you can type the words. If you could type one word each a time, uh, we are just trying to create a word cloud so you can to give a bit of a visual uh, count of the tar key targets. So can we do that? Right, so as you can see, we see the words popping up and some words are bigger than the others. Uh, it depends, this is depending on the people sending in the words and the common words. And if, if one word gets repeated, um, you see the word appearing bigger. And you also see as people type answers, um, the size of the word cloud also changes, right? So we will come back to the word cloud, keep sending your answers. Uh, we'll discuss this slide and we'll go back to the word cloud again to see 
how we are actually doing, right? Mm, right, so I said we want to talk about what fake news really entails, right? When we are having a conversation with people, the use of term fake news is quite popular. Everyone says it out loud, but the idea of what fake news really means is not really clear to many. So we thought if we want to identify what fake news is, and if you want to do something for fake news, we also need to understand what it entails, right? So like I said, there are three parts and you can see we have a Venn diagram where we have false and intent to harm, right? Misinformation, for an example, is false information, misleading content, but is shared without the intention of causing harm, right? You get something, for an example, um, you you really believe it now uh, for COVID. If someone tells you, if you stand in the sun for two hours a day, uh, you can kill the virus. You really believe it because you don't have access to information and you are not trying to mislead anyone. Out of goodwill, you share it with your people, right? Um, so it's misleading content. There's no proof that it happens. Um, but you don't have the intention to cause harm. Therefore, it means it falls under the category of misinformation. And I will also come to malinformation. Malinformation is you have the intention to cause harm, but that information, some parts of that information is not wrong, right? It's actually true. Now, the previous slide that you saw, the WHO uh, director um, talking about Sri Lanka being ranked at now, the top of the world's best healthcare system. That statement was actually made and Sri Lanka was actually ranked like world's best at some point, but it was in 2018, right? So the part where Sri Lanka was ranked number one is actually true, the one part of that information. What is wrong is that that information was given to the people to make it sound like it happened actually in 2020, right? In the middle of a global pandemic and also close to an election. So you are, you make the connection as to why it was, uh, not the connection, the possibility as to why it could have been made, right? So that is example an example for malinformation where you have the intent to cause harm, but you are not necessarily lying. You are just partly lying and partly selling the truth sort of a situation, right? And the part in the middle is the most, the crucial part where, and also the most damaging is disinformation, right? Where you have information that is false, you know it's false, regardless you are sharing it with the public or everyone, because you have an intention to cause harm, right? Uh, so we see false context, uh, Post content and manipulated content, or also the fabricated content, as it's given in the middle part of the Venn diagram, where it becomes disinformation, is shared. You very well know it's wrong information, but you want to cause harm, and then you share it, right? So that's amount of disinformation. Now, all three combined, also, the fake news is like this all encompassing umbrella term that people use, where all these kinds of speech come together. And I think we can go to the word cloud and then to the next slide. Okay, so we have a very interesting um, word cloud. Uh, I think Senil will Sanil might also want to explain this, Sanil. Yeah, so I think we have, um, we have like the finish said, quite an interesting and diverse uh, group. And I mean, I think this is not a right or wrong test. So uh, I'm sad and I'm quite sadly as well, all of these answers are correct, uh, which is not a, a uh, good thing to say that your answer is correct, but in this context, because we're talking about people being targeted on um, hate speech, uh, by hate speech, but but uh, but I think all of these answers, uh, whether they're kind of women or minority groups, uh, particularly the, the Muslim uh, minority in uh, in the post-2009 context uh, in this country, 
uh, but also other uh, minority groups as well. I think people have identified um, Tamils, Christians, uh, I think one had identified evangelical Christians specifically, uh, youth, people with disabilities, women, uh, definitely as well, uh, politicians, which, um, yeah, I, that's also a big target of, of hateful uh, speech, even though kind of some of us might have mixed feelings about them. Uh, they're also a big target of hate speech uh, content uh, as well. So um, sure. So maybe we'll go back to the, the slides uh, based on that. Um, and we will talk also, continue to talk more on hate speech as well. Um, I mean, as hashtag generation, our experience also is that all of those answers are, are correct, of course. Um, and, um, and ethnic minorities uh, definitely um, are, are kind of the biggest uh, target. And within that, uh, of course, the Muslim minority, as you have identified as well, uh, feature very uh, prominently. Uh, and amongst other groups, women and, and so on, uh, also uh, extremely uh, highly targeted. Um, can uh, you can see my you can see my slides, right? No, most is speaking out and I can share the screen if you want me to. Uh, yes, please. I yeah. just have too many windows open. Thank you. About that guys right uh yeah we are here all right uh thank you uh so um the um, this one is about having logos so um we also often assume that when something has a logo especially of a credible institution or if something is on letterhead that it is actually the truth or it is actually uh, the real the real uh, institution speaking but this is also not necessarily the case. Uh, we know that in Sri Lanka, for instance, the state letterheads have often been uh, been fabricated as well by different groups. Uh, but in this particular situation, the WHO's logo by itself was placed on this uh, in this piece of uh, misinformation, uh, which said that uh, that we shouldn't eat uh, bakery items during COVID-19. Uh, now the WHO itself and also other fact-checking organizations actually later confirmed that uh, the WHO hasn't. Uh, said anything like this. So I think the just because we also get something on WhatsApp or Facebook and so on, and that has an organization's logo, uh, that doesn't mean it's true. Uh, the only way we can confirm uh, if an organization has had said something is if we can find that piece of information on that organization's actual website or on their verified social media uh, page. Uh, it's uh, the, the blue tick on Facebook, YouTube, uh, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, for example, is helpful uh, to identify the, the actual verified page, uh, particularly with kind of large uh, international organizations and, and very popular figures, uh, and, uh, and, the, and, and, and what might be fake uh, pages. Uh, so I think that's important as well. Uh, the only way, way like a website or a, or a verified social media page can have false information is when that page is hacked or the administrator is changed, which is also a lie, which is also a lie, which could also happen, but is unlikely. It's not as uh, common as uh, someone photoshopping a logo into an image. Uh, so I think one way we can uh, believe uh, an, an organization said something is if their verified social media page or website said it. But of course, that's also not 100% true. Like in this age, it's easy to hack websites and uh, take over control of social media pages as well. So I guess uh, just need to be conscious of that as well. Um, all right, we can go to the next slide. So, um, so it's uh, important to remember also that images can very often and very easily be taken out of context. Now, this was an image that was uh, getting shared very widely during like, the first wave of the corona pandemic. Uh, that actually, this was the deaths in Italy. Now, of course, the, during the first wave, uh, there were kind of very tragic deaths in Italy, but it was, uh, but it did not look like this, and it was not uh, on the roads in in this this uh, in this way. Uh, it was later confirmed by fact-checking organizations and so on that it was actually from a performance art piece uh, that was done in Germany, if I'm not uh, mistaken, uh, and um, and that the picture was actually misused uh, during 
uh, COVID-19. Now, uh, if an image is getting misused, um, there are a couple of things that options that we have. Uh, we are going to show you a couple of them, not, not everything. So in the next slide, we have one option, uh, which is Google reverse image search. Now, this is an option that all of us can use and maybe some of you have used. Um, and maybe in uh, at this point, I'll share screen and just show how um, Google reverse image search works. Basically, Google reverse image search is uh, very simple. It's like, uh, it's like when we are able to kind of uh, reverse, uh, run a Google search of a word or a phrase, we can do instead of an image. Uh, so here I am sharing a screen and I'm showing Glossy Lanka News website, which is amongst the top 20 websites in Sri Lanka. And I found one uh, image. So it says, uh, this is from today. Uh, and this image, right? It's an image of a cemetery, for instance. Uh, now, if you want to check if this image is actually from Sri Lanka, now I think most of us would assume that, is that this image may not be from Sri Lanka. But say it's something a little bit more thought provoking and you want to confirm uh, that image is actually the right one. The easiest way to go about it is to right click on that and then click the search Google for image button. Uh, and then then Google searches that image for you and shows where else uh, that image or similar images are available. So we can see that the same image has, for example, been used by uh, Gossip Lanka earlier. Uh, as well, so it's quite popular in there. It's probably in their kind of images archive. So every time they report on deaths, they use that. But it's also been used by a website called epaleo.com and so on. So you can see that uh, wherever that image, same image has been used earlier, uh, you can see that uh, on uh, Google. Uh, it's, for example, uh, been used throughout uh, the pandemic. So then we know that that actually uh, that's not an image from uh, today's. Uh, depths. Um, so that's an easy tool that all of us can use. You can also do the same, for example, uh, uh, by uploading an image. Uh, so you just go to kind of images.google.com, click on the camera here, and then upload it here. Uh, so you choose the file and then upload the image if it's on your desktop. Uh, you can also do this on the phone, for example, if you're using either the Chrome or the Google uh, browser, uh, but also uh, some of the other search engines facilitate that as well. Uh, another tool that does the same thing is called TNI. Uh, it's also uh, useful. Um, another place you can use the same thing, for example, is where you meet someone on Facebook and then they have a very attractive profile picture, uh, but you actually want to check if that person is uh, the person they're claiming to be. Now, this doesn't apply to everyone. For example, private individuals like all of us, our photos may not work on reverse image search, but if they're using, for example, an Indian pop star's image, uh, or a South Indian uh, actor's image or an actress's image, uh, then you might be able to catch that person uh, using reverse image search. So reverse image is actually quite a, a useful uh, website uh, in that sense. Um, maybe we can go back to the slides. I'll share the screen. Sure. Okay. Really, I mean, I can also just show the. I think we can directly go to the other ones, no? Internet sure. archive. So there are two things: Internet archive and Amnesty Video Viewer. I think so. You can directly show that. Sure, sure. So another website that we wanted to show, which is also um, helpful, is this website. Uh, is a tool called the uh, Internet Archive, uh, which is also called the Wayback uh, Machine which is an archive of uh, some of the kind of the leading websites uh, on the internet. Uh, and they archive these websites quite uh, frequently. Now, what, where this is useful is, uh, for example, if you want to uh, run a search of, um, of, a, of a website uh, and you want to see if that website has later been edited. Uh, for example, a lot of websites currently uh, have an uh, have a um, have a website uh, like a page, but later the page gets edited. For example, uh, um, a page can today say there were uh, today there were uh, ten deaths, but later the same website from the back end can easily be edited to be twenty deaths. Uh, now the Internet Archive is an easy uh, good place for us to see the older versions of this same uh, website. Uh, it's like a 
archive of uh, the internet in some sense. I'm just going to uh, share my screen. Um, so this is the this is the Internet Archive website. It's just archive.org, and it's uh, super simple. You find the link that you want to uh, search. Uh, so I've just found a random uh, link here, uh, and then I will share a search that um, link. So if you want to see what I'm searching, I'm searching a CNN article on Sri Lanka and uh, COVID post COVID. Uh, travel uh, or what we thought was going to be post-COVID travel, um, and now uh, it's um, not it. But when we search that, then it shows us uh, all of the times the Internet Archive has archived that image. And um, and for example, if uh, you want to go back to um, an earlier page and um, and then show the um, show that website then you are able to uh, check that. So I'm able to, for example, check uh, the same website on May 5th. And then they would also show the different times that they archive the website at. Um, I can click on the timestamp I want. And then what I then see uh, on the screen is the uh, is the basically the website at that time. So if there have been any changes since then, then what I'm seeing on the screen now is the website as it looked on uh, the uh, 23rd of April, 2021, uh, for example. Uh, so that's a useful one for websites that uh, can be changed later. But again, this is not 100% accurate. The person who is running the website, for example, can change the data as it reflects on the, for example, if they've done something quite dodgy, uh, they can go to the back end and edit that in a way that also it might not be reflected here. Uh, but for people who are a little bit less, a uh, little not as careful, uh, like some of our uh, colleagues, uh, this actually works. Um, so, um, so that's a useful one uh, in that sense. The other tool that we wanted to uh, share with you, uh, this and this is the final one, is called the uh, Amnesty uh, Video and uh, Amnesty Video Viewer. Um, and on that website, you can do something quite similar, but with uh, YouTube videos. So the website name is quite long. It's citizenevidence.amnesty.org. Uh, but I mean, I would just go on YouTube and search Amnesty Video Viewer, uh, for example. What this allows you to do is to search a YouTube um, video, and you're able to do a search on that. So I'm just going on um, YouTube. Uh, picking this um, video from two months ago. And then I can do a video search of that, uh, of that um, video on the Amnesty uh, YouTube data viewer. Uh, so I just do go there. And then this one, they show me information like what time the, um, sorry, I just had too many windows of here. Yeah. Uh, so it shows me information like uh, what time the video was uploaded, uh, the upload date, uh, date, and so on. But it also shows me, it gives me stills of the video that then that I can run reverse image searches on, which is quite cool. I mean, in this particular situation, it uh, it's not it's very useful. But for instance, if someone is showing you images of a protest and saying they are from Sri Lanka, but actually you feel like maybe they are from Myanmar, for instance, then you can do the reverse image from the video footage of that news item. And then you can confirm whether that's actually uh, from that situation or not. So what then Google has now done is run a reverse image search of that still of the YouTube video, and it's showing me uh, all of the people that look like uh, that person. Uh, so again, it's a very useful tool, particularly for uh, YouTube uh, videos. Uh, so those those are just um, three tools that we wanted to share with you. Again, these are uh, they're very uh, user-friendly ones that you can actually spend some time uh, on those websites and, and kind of run through them, and you'll be uh, pros in no time. Uh, so just check them uh, out uh, when you're free. Uh, and yeah, and, and it sounds interesting. Right, maybe we can go back to the slides. Um, since Helen and I have spoken for over 45 minutes, I think now, um, uh, do we have any questions at this point? Of 
from the apps that we have spoken about or the tools that the simple things that we told you all. Um, any questions at this point? Uh, if not, we can actually go to the other part of the presentation. But if you have questions, either you can switch on your mic and ask the question or also type it in the chat. You can raise your hand or ask a question. If not, we are also happy to continue. Looks like we will have to continue. Um, okay. Um, so I will come to the next part of it. Right. Um, this is something also it's quite interesting. And uh, we see this happening uh, so, so many times. But we also see uh, a lot of people being getting um, engaging with this kind of uh, profiles where, you know, if someone is posting a video that is questionable or is something that you also feel a bit dodgy about, you also has this instinct where, you know, there's something wrong with it, but we also don't know what's actually wrong with it sort of situations. I'm sure we have all, all of us have gone through these similar situations. Uh, it's something that we can do is also to identify whether these profiles are actually trolls, right? Where uh, we have given a bit of an example here where, you know, you have this Kaluranchi or Princess Kasuni or some really odd names that we also know that might be fake profiles, might be created for the purpose of, you know, getting engagement or having a conversation going without revealing the identity. Um, and we also, if you go to their friends to I figure out who they are or their profile pictures, it could be the only profile picture that they have. They have, Or you also see profiles that were created like three days ago, but you have like 20 pictures of the same guy or the same girl in, in the same angle or like, like you know, you there's this, uh, you can identify these profiles. So also be mindful of the content that is coming out from those profiles. And if they're engaging with you, because more often than not, they are fake profiles or that they are, the profiles are for trolling, right? So that is also a little tip that we can keep in mind, uh, especially when we are dealing with fake news. Um, and this is a uh, tricky one in the sense uh, to understand whether there's an agenda behind the information that is given to us in any form. It could be a video, it could be a poster, it could be a post uh, with someone being angry, right? Um, but to figure out whether there's an agenda behind a post is tough because for that you also need a bit of understanding of the context, uh, who these actors are, uh, what is the political situation in the country, things like that. Um, those things are a little, I mean, you need a bit of background knowledge to uh, figure out what's wrong with these posts or whether there is an actual agenda. Um, so I have, we have taken a couple of screenshots, right? Um, uh, some of them are actually in, sorry, Sinhala, uh, but this is across the board. Mostly it's about at the... So this is uh, anti-Muslim hate speech or hate speech towards the Muslim community or the Islamic community, right? Um, the problem, the hate speech or the issue is that when you have these ultra-nationalistic uh, versions or narratives come through, uh, especially on Facebook, like we, on social media, like we spoke about 98% of our internet users use their phone to access the internet. And so, so then it's like an infodemic where you have a lot of information coming to you, right? And then for ordinary people, like Sanil said that when he started, not all of us can fact check and verify everything that we see and not everyone is it has the time also. So it's they just consume whatever the information that's available for them on social media. Now, the problem is for ordinary people, when they start uh, consuming this information, and it's really complex and also so negative or that there's uncertainty. It also leads to this idea of um, stereotypes in the sense. So when you see this information over and over again, 
it feeds into these inherent stereotypes that most of us have, right? So then when it feeds to a stereotype to say, okay, uh, a, a person belonging to a particular religion or from a particular background or from a particular geographical location, they are amount to A, B, and C. So it's like a stereotype that's within us. Sometimes we are aware of it, but sometimes we actually don't know We actually uh, that it's an inherent stereotype that is coming out in our thinking. Uh, so what happens is when you have, when you form stereotypes around this, that's where it leads to hate speech also. We see um, um, this, uh, these ideas getting um, deposited or we inculcate this stereotype uh, because it makes us feel safe because it's something that we know no one is challenging our knowledge this is something that has been told to me for the last 20 years or 15 years therefore this is a fact and it's easy to internalize these things right and it's also we feel safe um because of these things we internalize this idea the stereotypes and the prejudices and it also leads to hate speech so that's why because at the outset when you really look at it we might not see okay uh there's nothing really, the language is also most of the time neutral, uh, but there's no real harm if you don't know the context of the people who are speaking, or the people who are spreading this information. Uh, because if you don't have their context, if you, example, if you pick the picture in the middle, where you see uh, that's a mosque, and you see uh, Muslims going into the mosque, and when they're coming out, they have become uh, coronavirus, right? That's what they're trying to say. Uh, but so this also, if you remember the context at the point a little, this is how the Muslims are portrayed during the first, especially the first wave of the COVID uh, pandemic in Sri Lanka, as where the reason for the spread of coronavirus in Sri Lanka is Muslim. So these things, when you hear those in the mainstream media, and when you see these things on social media, like I said, uh, feeds into your existing stereotypes. So it's really, really important to be mindful of what you believe and what you really feel and what you really see also. Um, when you see this kind of speech, because we spoke about it, we, we told you all what misinformation is, what malinformation is, and what disinformation is, right? Disinformation is most of the time is used as a vehicle to uh, go towards hate speech, right? But if you see this kind of content, this is how you can report content on social media, especially sorry, Facebook. I'm sure some of you might know it or have used it. Please make sure that you flag it where you, you understand it as a false news or it could be harassment, terrorism. You can see the categories on the screen. And also, once you mark it as hate speech, we also they also expect you to mark the correct category. Now, if we it's if it has something to do with the Muslims, um, if the information is hate speech towards Muslims, then you correctly pick the category of uh, race or ethnicity or religious affiliation. If it's about gender, then you pick the gender uh, component or the category, right? So that's something that you can do um, instead of. Okay, that's one thing is to uh, not consume fake news and just move past it. And also like actively, you can contribute to this, actually the war with um, disinformation or fake news by taking small steps. Uh, sorry. Um, another thing that, uh, that all of us uh, can do is also to follow fact-checking organizations. Um, Fact-checking organizations, because like we said in the beginning, all of us don't have the time to do investigations and fact-checks and confirm uh, whether stories are true or not. It takes uh, lots of effort and labor and time. Um, and maybe with our other commitments, we're not able to do that. Uh, so, so following fact-checking organizations uh, are, um, is one uh, step that all of us can take. Here we've identified a few, uh, including uh, a not so modestly ourselves. Uh, we also do uh, fact checks um, as well um, um, recently, not uh, not a lot, but we also do fact checking. Uh, we've also identified the AP and fact crescendo. Uh, now, particular fact checks of, um, and also citizen.lk as well, 
a particular fact check. So some of the fact checkers themselves are also sometimes have been, people have raised questions about it. So kind of putting them on the screen doesn't mean that kind of we are endorsing that everything they fact check is going to be 100% accurate, for instance. I think what we advocate for is that anything you read anywhere, uh, um, should everyone should read them critically uh, and, and with a sense uh, of, of being critical of them. Uh, so the idea here is not to kind of say um, who you can believe and who you cannot, because uh, because it's hard to uh, do that. Uh, but to actually say whatever you do, uh, you need to uh, be more critical. But we've identified uh, some of the organizations and and so on, and and particularly related to COVID nineteen on the image uh, as well. Um, now on Facebook, on the next slide, uh, you can. Uh, see how on Facebook, if uh, some of the fact checkers that they work with, uh, they are amongst the ones that we showed earlier, uh, confirm something to be false, then now they put this screen on top uh, saying kind of it is confirmed as false information by independent fact checkers. Now, personally, I think that this is a good development. Uh, this doesn't work uh, across the board. There have been gaps, but these gaps are improving. Um, and, um, and, and for me, I find this, uh, this screen quite helpful. Um, in that, uh, for example, if I share something and then uh, the screen comes on top of something that's on my timeline, of course, I'll find it uh, quite embarrassing that I've shared something uh, wrong uh, without my knowledge. Um, so uh, so I probably at least delete it. And also maybe next time I'll be a bit more watch, uh, watchful and mindful about doing the same thing again. Uh, so I think uh, I think this can affect people's behavior. So not just in terms of uh, affecting that particular news story, but also uh, in terms of how all of us behave on the internet uh, as well. Of course, this doesn't work all the time. Everything doesn't get fact-checked, fact -checked, and everything doesn't that gets fact-checked is also doesn't uh, get these screens as well, uh, but it still is some kind of uh, helpful feature. Um, can go to the next slide. Um, I mean, another uh, thing that uh, that you can do that, that we, ask, we ask you to do as well, if you... Uh, see something that's uh, particularly uh, problematic that you think could be fact-checked or that you think is hateful, uh, then to also uh, share those messages with us uh, using uh, these channels. Uh, and then we can see if we can, um, we can uh, kind of respond to those types of content uh, as well. Um, I'm sorry, I just keep going back and forth. Yeah. So um, in terms of um, now as, uh, as a hashtag, something that we have completely uh, realized uh, that there is definitely kind of a gendered element to all types of hate speech. But on the one hand, kind of women are disproportionately targeted uh, by hate speech. Two, um, and what also our data points to is that men are disproportionately producers of hate speech uh, as well. Uh, so, so we've done some analysis on that, and both of those things um, are true. Uh, on the one hand, men produce the vast majority of hate speech, uh, and on the other hand, women are the women are the vast majority of the targets of hate speech in terms of gender. Uh, and this is also not just kind of uh, sexist um, and and so on language, but it's also content that uh, that has. Uh, that's also related to uh, ethnicity, religion, and so on. All of these types of uh, hate speech also has gendered elements, whether it's about kind of women's dress or women's bodies or women producing, uh, women producing too many children, women not producing too many children. So different elements of uh, gender elements uh, in all types of hate speech as well. And even in terms of um, Kind of attacks on NGOs and people that kind of advocate for peace building and so on. Uh, often these uh, that type that type of uh, particularly men are seen as kind of not masculine enough, and and people also use kind of uh, slurs that people use on queer people and so on, on people that advocate for peace building and so on as well. Uh, and then then again there is an element of uh, gender there in that uh, in that uh, being racist and sharing that type of hate speech. Is seen as the way, only way to be kind of masculine and perform that type of role as well. So I think there's a lot to uh, work on uh, that type of uh, content as well. Mm, I mean, uh, these are just, I mean, for the next few slides, maybe to kind of conclude, we just added some examples for types of content that we found 
uh, and verified using the same techniques that we described earlier. Uh, now we spoke about reverse image search. Now this, for example, this image we found earlier on a parody page, actually not by the same institution that has the logo on it, even though that institution also produces a lot of very questionable types of content online. This is actually a page that parodies the same organization, uh, but this page, uh, this uh, post was uh, shared on one of those. Um, and later kind of um, uh, reverse image search, so a simple reverse image search revealed that there actually this, uh, that there was not um, a so the, the post says for someone who doesn't read Sinhala that there was a uh, there was a kind of a caterpillar found in a burger uh, at the McDonald's uh, and that basically a big conspiracy about how this can lead to your the go into the stomach and then and, and uh, affect your digestive system and, and all types of things like that um, and if you and and when you did the reverse image uh, function uh, we found out on the next slide that it's actually uh, actually a burger, but um, but from many years ago, uh, and also um, founded a McDonald's in the USA, uh, for example. Uh, so so sharing, uh, using some of these tools can actually, uh, it might seem like quite like something that that, want, that, that we, we don't want to do in our everyday lives and, and something that maybe journalists should be doing, but actually they're so easy to use and they're actually sometimes things that we can use on our day-to-day uh, -day lives to do quick verifications uh, as well. Um, another thing is to, I mean, again, um, now Netmini already spoke about malinformation. Right? Uh, malinformation, as Netmini described as well, is content that is true, uh, but is used out of context. Right? Now, this post we've seen whenever there is some kind of racist uh, or anti-Muslim wave of content online, this particular BBC article gets shared quite widely. Now, again, we can't classify that as misinformation because it's not untrue. It has gone on the, the BBC as well. But again, the BBC reporting as well, actually, if you read into it, is quite, uh, the headline is quite big date and so on because Pakistan actually hasn't uh, uh, legalized uh, violence against women. It's some group of clerics that have advocated it and so on. But, but it's still some type of uh, source that, that you can uh, have some faith in. But actually, the report is from 2016. Um, and, and as you can see, a screenshot is from 2019, but it's not just happening in 2019, but every now and then, whenever there is some anti-Muslim wave of conversation, this particular article, which is because it's in the BBC and so on, it gives it some kind of credibility uh, and it gets uh, shared. Uh, so what Netmini said earlier about checking the date, uh, this is why that's also super important because we might believe that we, the moment we see the BBC and so on, we might think it's credible, but actually it might be very old news. Uh, about COVID-19, maybe you're sharing something, but actually it's an article about the SARS virus. You know, so it's important to um, to check the date uh, as well. We uh, have we'll go through the slides, no? Yeah, sorry, you were gonna say something. Sorry, no, because of the interest of the time, uh, these, the slides that we have after this, uh, it's also for similar reasons that we have put it. Yeah, so I just yeah. want to say, yeah, because we might, we are running out of time. And also yeah. this is also a similar incident where during the Ahapalna regime, this picture came out to say, you know, this is how the roads are being done and you can roll out the carpet sort of a situation. And there were comments and 7.8K shares. But also when you really check it, it's something that happened in India. Uh, but I mean, it looked, if you go back to the previous image, it looked really localized or it looks as if it's actually from Sri Lanka. But when you check it, it's from India. Um, this is also something this, I think, came out during this, uh, if I'm not mistaken, the situation of the, where the, the, the tapes of uh, Ranjan Ramanayaka came out. Um, and there was a whole conversation on social media about it where it says for 50 million rupees, Sirasa has brought, bought all these uh, voice clips or the tapes, right? So then it's really interesting. It's very clickbaity and it's Gossip Lanka. Uh, should explain something with that. But anyway, people were so excited and then they don't even read these things, right? That is the importance of you reading these things because when you really look at it, what has happened is Sirasa, 
uh, has taken the franchise of the voice to Sri Lanka, spending 50 million rupees. Um, so that's the thing, right? It's, it's when there's a contest, when there's a conversation, if you want to get your message across, you just use these clickbait headlines. So the, the, the tapes that they have referred to in the clickbait headline is not actually the tapes that were discussed about at the time, but all actually the voice franchise. Um, this is also a similar situation. It says Mahindi is going to resign with a picture of Kota Bharati Paksha. Uh, and when you see this picture, you immediately, there are sad reacts also. So when you see this image, you immediately think, oh, the, the current prime minister is going to resign. But actually, who was going to resign is the former chair of the election commission, Mahindi Deshapriya. Right? So these are misleading. These are to get uh, your reaction um things like that so it's really really important that you read these things and also always check the information that you see um this is also an interesting situation um where i i don't know whether you all remember there was this paper article that says they have found uh bricks on mars uh but the nasa's announcement was actually finding basic building blocks of life on Mars, but how Sri Lankan media reported is to say they found bricks on Mars, right? So this is, it says also a platform that you can look at because they also share interesting content, uh, especially from mainstream media. So this is the uh, idea. If you don't have access to what NASA has said, and if you don't really Google it, some might actually think that actually people thought that they found bricks on Mars. Uh, so anyway. Yeah, so like uh, Nefini is saying, uh, this information is not uh, uh, kind of limited to uh, the, the social media space. It is, on, it is on our front page newspapers, it's on our prime time news, it's on our communities when we talk to each other in person. Uh, so it's not kind of limited to WhatsApp groups and Facebook, it's on the, main, the, the mainstream uh, press as well. So we can't kind of, uh, we can't watch the, the news and read the newspaper and so on. Uh, without um, without expecting uh, it to be 100% uh, accurate as well. We still need to think of all of these things that we'll be talking about kind of consuming content critically there as well. Now, um, coordinated uh, inauthentic behavior is um, is basically Facebook's uh, language, but what they, but what they, but what this kind of broadly means is that you put where is when multiple pages and multiple accounts put out similar content at the around the same time. Uh, and it appears to be kind of coordinated and also inauthentic. So it's not like kind of net mini me and, and all of us independent of each other decided to share something similar because we felt like it, but actually it's something quite strategic and coordinated um, and so on. So we know that in Sri Lanka as well, this is also quite common, particularly to target uh, kind of politicians uh, who might be uh, in your political opposition, but also from within your own party, if you want, because if you consider them as a threat and so on, this has been used quite continuously. Uh, so this is quite easy, um, as in, uh, if you go on your timeline and you see everyone sharing the same thing, uh, it might not be that that's actually, in fact, the biggest story of the day. It might be that it's actually kind of artificially manufactured to be the biggest story of the day by the administrator of, this, of these Facebook pages who are probably talking to each other. Uh, and, and kind of have this kind of thing planned. So it's also important to remember that even if the same thing is shared by multiple pages and each of those pages have thousands of likes, that it's, it might actually still be coordinated and inauthentic as well. Now, Facebook, for example, globally has committed that they will they remove this type of content and they take this type of content to be in violation of their kind of community standards and so on. Uh, but, um, but locally, kind of there's a lot more that needs to be done in terms of uh, this side of things. So um, I guess the previous one was just a quick example of okay. that as well, uh, just in the local context, uh, uh, when the when there was the uh, presidential pardon uh, of uh, of Sunil Ratnayake, there were also kind of similar posts that were uh, getting shared, uh, which we thought was amounting to kind of types of coordination in our behavior as well. Uh, in, Sunil, before we take this slide, shall we have a couple of questions. Maybe we can take them. Sure. 
Do you want to? Um, that's a long question. Um, okay, interesting question. Uh, we'll come to that. Um, there are two questions in it about uh, what trolling means um, and also the actions that can be taken against malinformation. information. Sure. Uh, so trolling uh, is when uh, someone is trying to basically, when it, someone is particularly, I mean, trolling, I think is a fishing term, isn't it? When you focus on a particular area and then try and, uh, and catch fish. Now, in, I think the term is used on the internet space in the same kind of sense that you are deliberately trying to provoke someone. Uh, you're trying to kind of uh, provoke them and get their attention and possibly to kind of get their emotions up in the same way that we spoke about when we were talking about name it to tame it and then trying to get some kind of response to them. Often trolls are, um, for, trolls are kind of bots or people with fake accounts, but trolls can well be human beings who, who kind of get some, uh, some kind of pleasure out of doing this as well. But a troll is generally someone who's provoking you to get your attention. Now the best, uh, at least, I mean, my, I mean, our advice is dealing when dealing with trolls is to try and not engage. But of course, uh, all of us uh, sometimes can't resist it, and we get into big uh, uh, disagreements with trolls. But the best, um, but the best case scenario actually is to not engage with trolls because that's what they want. They want you to engage. They know that uh, they're not kind of trying to reach an agreement. They're not trying to learn how to think critically in the digital age. They're just trying to um, provoke you. And the best way to go about that is sometimes to not engage. Of course, maybe there, there are times when they say particularly hateful things that you feel like something needs to be said and so on, and we, we are not stopping you from engaging in that type of uh, responses. But uh, but sometimes uh, the best, and, and, and maybe possibly for your mental health as well, the best way might be to not uh, engage with trolls. So um, the other question was, Actions that can be taken against malinformation. So that this is this is actually this links to also the question on disinformation in some way as well about regulation. Um, often there is not much that can be done against um, malinformation because it's not untrue, um, and then and if it's not untrue, then it can't be fact checked. Uh, I mean, it can be fact checked in the sense that if something is getting kind of shared very kind of widely and people misunderstand something to be true, fact-checking organizations and so on can do clarifications, um, but uh, but that kind of content can't be removed uh, necessarily. Uh, I mean, unless there are some types of malinformation like like private, uh, like leaks of private conversations and so on, uh, if you feel like that could uh, harm people's privacy, harm people's uh, safety and so on, then that, that, that can kind of content can be removed. But if it's not, uh, if it doesn't amount to a violation of that sort, uh, then uh, often uh, that type of content cannot uh, be uh, removed, which is why we also advocate for thinking kind of critically uh, about all of these things, um, thinking critically about all of these things, regardless of whether uh, it's kind of true or not and, and so on, because then we are kind of, we may not be able to verify everything, but we are looking at everything uh, a bit more critically and that sometimes is uh, super important. Um, final question. Uh, we have another question. I think I will start. Maybe Sunil can add. It's about the proposed criminalization of spread of fake news. Um, the question is: There's huge potential of it that we misuse for political purposes and political agendas. Absolutely, we agree with it. Uh, but if the law was to criminalize this ethically and correctly, how would the law balance the nuances between securing the right to free speech and preventing the spread of fake news? Uh, what provisions do you think would be ideal? Uh, should this be done independently rather than by the government and state affiliated entity? So I will start, right? Um, so freedom of expression as it stands in our constitution also has exceptions. People can't say everything that comes into their minds, right? So uh, right, freedom of expression is uh, given to us or it's secu not given to us, secured in Article 14, 1, I think. But if you look at Article 15.2, Article 15.7, it talks about the exceptions to freedom of expression. It says for defamation, or for national security, for public order, you uh, for these things, you can restrict your freedom of expression. So there are already restrictions. 
and we already have laws like the ICCPR, the police ordinance, the penal code, um, the Computer Crimes Act, right? There are provisions and there are laws that are already in place with regard to this, uh, the wrong information being spread or using information to cause disharmony sort of things. In middle of that, like you have correctly identified in the question, obviously there are issues if you criminalize space for engagement because Facebook, right, especially these days, is like a free space that we can share ideas, communicate with people, and also share, uh, express our dissent, our opinions. Um, in that context, if you if we criminalize it, obviously there are going to be the curbing of the dissent and there will be disproportionate consequences um for uh as a result of the criminalizing right uh i'm sure Sinan can add but like you have asked in the latter part of your question where you know we take independent steps that's the reason that we are talking here and ics also organized this webinar is also one such part where instead of we get state to um monitor it or regularize this space where i have assessed individuals get involved uh, think critically, engage better, and also get this message across to all the people so that uh, this cannot, the spread of fake news cannot be the front of a mechanism or a system where the free speech can be limited or restricted. Um, Senil might have more to add. No, I think Nathan is already covered it. I mean, uh, just to kind of summarize something she already said. Uh, on one level, a lot of types of disinformation are already covered in the law, right? including things that incite uh, violence and so on. So these things are already covered in the law as uh, as offenses. So on, then on the one hand, then there is uh, not a need for that. On the other hand, let me also give these examples of other laws that uh, kind of uh, regulate speech in some way. And a lot of these, and all of these, uh, often have been misused as the question itself identifies. Uh, to kind of benefit uh, different states that were in power uh, at different times, particularly to kind of target, uh, uh, particularly for different political interests, particularly for different ethno-nationalist interests and so on. Um, so that's kind of the, the context. Um, and in such a context, kind of bringing criminal sanction against uh, disinformation, uh, we think is quite uh, harmful because we're also not talking about just regulation, we're talking about putting possibly people in jail uh, for the things that they're uh, saying uh, and that kind of thing can be uh, quite uh, quite dangerous, uh, particularly because it could be used uh, by uh, by the powers uh, that be at, at whatever time uh, to their benefit. Um, now, if uh, to kind of answer the second half of your question, if what we think should happen, uh, it's again what Nethmini said. I mean, to add to that, maybe kind of we think uh, from school itself, if the state has a genuine interest in uh, addressing harmful content and disinformation and so on, we think they should in, uh, introduce critical thinking skills to the curriculum from the younger stage and teach these things in school because there's already an ICT curriculum, but a lot of the types of things that they learn are kind of how the mainframe computers were really big and then gradually they evolve into the palm size. Uh, I mean, the father of modern computing, the MS office packages. Now, all of these are actually important things, but we think that these skills also need to be uh, taught to skill, uh, kids and, and it's super important uh, to, to children in school, universities, out of school, uh, vocational training, uh, education centers, in all of these institutions that the state has access to much more than uh, all of us, uh, the, then the state can use that. Uh, secondly, the state can also, I mean, this is of course all wishful thinking, but encourage independent journalism as opposed to stifling it, uh, encourage uh, critical voices as opposed to stifling it. So that then there are diverse views coming forward and then people then be able to look at all of those views and make their own decision as opposed to trying to uh, kind of censor uh, particular uh, groups. Yeah. Um, okay, so um, unfortunately, I think we have covered one and a half hours. So we had these two slides we wanted to really talk about, about, but we also have another session next week, same time. I think one of our colleagues will be doing it. Uh, he should be able to address. So I'm going to take the next question. Um, yeah, um, it says, how many misinformation, malinformation and disinformation cycles happen per year in Sri Lanka? Have you seen any particular trends in the past few years? I would start by saying every week or every three, four days, there's a new 
this information cycle. Um, but again, uh, and it has been always, like we said in the bird cloud, it has been targeting Muslims, the women, the minorities, ethnic, religious, or sexual, uh, gen sorry, gender minorities. So um, it has, I mean, it has, it has happened to politicians, political disinformation cycles, like it's every two, three days. And it's like, we sometimes we can't keep up with what's happening because it's so many cycles. Senator Kenneth. Yeah, I mean, it's what Nipne said there is, it's kind of hard to call some call and keep track of uh, cycles for disinformation because there is just too many uh, of it uh, and from all kinds of uh, different channels. Uh, and uh, and I mean, often the big ones, and it depends on kind of which particular story it is, but often a lot of these last a few weeks and then everyone forgets about them. Like no one's talking about the cattle ban or, like, or the veils anymore, right? Because we moved on from that and there are new, uh, new types of conspiracies that we talk about. And then again, there's a new one and then there's a new one. And then we kind of move on uh, from uh, each of these, like, uh, like uh, two for two weeks, all of us will talk about, talk about the madrasa schools. And then we'll move on and then no one will talk about the mother of the school for some time until it comes up. So these waves keep coming up and dying down. Um, there are kind of small, there are trends that you can observe, uh, but these are kind of linked to time and so on. For example, if Aurudu is coming, you know there's going to be boycotts uh, of, uh, of uh, enterprises owned by particular ethnic groups. That's, that's a given. Every Aurudu, that, that, that it will happen. Um, so like that, related to particular situations, particular events going on in the country, there will definitely kind of be different types of disinformation, but there's just going to be um, kind of too many to tell you how many happen every year or how many uh, happen and so on. Um, I am going to go to, uh, if we have more questions, we will take them. Um, so these are the two slides that we thought we would want to talk, discuss about like the last question says what is our role what we can do and also tips on the raising awareness part but unfortunately uh, it's it, it will take time like 20 25 minutes but my colleague who will be discussing these things next week will go through these things in detail um and also these are the places that you can find our work and the fact checks that we do or the digital literacy work that we do uh, we just wanted to add this slide, but uh, before ending, I think Senel has something cool to talk about. No, um, I mean, basically we've spoken so much about the negative, uh, all the terrible things on the internet, the hate speech and the disinformation. But of course, we don't want to leave on the note that the internet is this really terrible space where only terrible things happen, because actually in some ways the internet is also a great place. It's given all of us this space to create all kinds of cool stuff but for us as hashtag generation kind of the beginning of our work uh, goes back to kind of using social media uh, for this type of work uh, so we wanted to just share something uh, we uploaded kind of immediately uh, before we started uh, today's uh, session um, i mean if you check the timestamp it's probably like a few minutes before we started our session so we were uh, quite excited about it and i know that sharing uh, videos on zoom sometimes can be uh, quite tricky so if it doesn't work very well uh, apologies for that but with uh, especially related to some of the conversations happening on social media particularly on twitter uh, we made this video and we made it uh, kind of over a few hours so it's not a kind of really intense process uh, something that we spend hours and days conceptualizing and coming up with uh, but we just to conclude uh, we want to share uh, this video uh, and then uh, end things for the day
All right. Uh, on that note, uh, thank you very much for listening to the both of us uh, over a couple of hours. Uh, thank you very much and have a, have a very good evening. Thank you so much, Mini. It has been a really insightful event, and also we really appreciate the work you're doing. Uh, and all of us will be sharing and looking at your work, especially the hashtag MeToo movement that you all have been just doing out right, right now. Uh, we want to thank all of you in the audience also for being uh, with us during these sessions. We appreciate the time you are spending with us and also the support that you are showing our series. Do stay in tune uh, and register for the last session if you haven't already uh, on how you can think critically in the digital age. It's the second part of today's workshop, also hosted by the youth organization Hashtag Generation. We will see you all soon. Thank you. <laughs>